When Elizabeth I became queen, it's easy for many people to assume that she turned England back into a Protestant country after the notoriously Catholic reign of Mary I. But this isn't really the case. Whilst her siblings favoured two different forms of Christian worship and tradition, often butting heads and arguing fervently among themselves, Elizabeth was a woman resolved to compromise. Elizabeth I was raised as a Protestant, and when she came to the throne, England was undoubtedly apprehensive about her religious views and what it could mean for them as subjects. Religion was a top priority for the government, and shortly after becoming Queen in 1558, Elizabeth assembled Parliament. Ambassadors and clergymen alike waited anxiously for any hint or whisper of religious development. Those who feared another reform were in for some dismay, because Elizabeth did mean to upheave the Catholic traditions of her sister. Although her coronation had been a Catholic ceremony due to it quickly following the death of Mary I, whose own coronation had been a Protestant ceremony following the rule of their brother Edward VI. Elizabeth was about to have England take leave of the Roman Church once again. But Elizabeth would not attempt to abolish Catholicism completely. This time would be different for the English people, because Elizabeth was about to create her religious settlement of 1559. One of the things Elizabeth was able to establish was the Act of Supremacy, this act would have Elizabeth assume the title as Supreme Governor of the Church in England. A previous bill that sought to have Elizabeth declared as Supreme Head of the Church, just as Henry VIII had been, was put forward in February that year. It would be the first of such bills to be turned down. In fact, the Supremacy Bill took form through several drafts and refusals before finally being passed in April 1559. It's worth noting that the Act succeeded with a majority of just one vote, after several months of discussion and dismissals. The clergy weren't even involved during the debates in Parliament at this time, and their firm belief in transubstantiation and the Pope's supreme power of the Church meant that it was in Elizabeth's best interest to have them kept away from the decision-making. The Act of Supremacy's final form was adapted as a compromise. Elizabeth would accept her position as Supreme Governor, not the Supreme Head, of the Church of England, and this was largely due to her gender. Alison Weir explains this in her book, Elizabeth the Queen, by noting that the bishops and some MPs expressed doubts as to whether a woman could be Supreme Head of the Church, for St Paul had stated that no woman was permitted to act as apostle, shepherd, doctor, or preacher. What the Act also managed to do was allow Catholics some freedom to privately believe the Pope to be God's anointed head of the Church, whilst also accepting Elizabeth's authority in England. Rather than accept and renounce one or the other, the Pope and the Supreme Governor could coexist in the minds of Catholics who weren't prepared to surrender their loyalty to Rome. Elizabeth demanded that all office holders, such as JPs, judges, mayors and clergymen, swear an oath acknowledging her as the supreme governor of the church, and refusal would mean surrendering one's office. Preaching in a way that suggested Elizabeth was beneath the power of the Pope was now an offence punishable by removing property and possessions. If someone were bold enough to re-offend, they could then find themselves facing charges of high treason and possible death. So although Elizabeth was lenient, she was also very serious that people obey the Act of Supremacy and set up the Ecclesiastical High Commission to monitor the clergy and have punishment enforced where necessary. Elizabeth would also introduce the Act of Uniformity in 1559 this act ensured that all churches in England were operating in the same way and with the same ornamentation and prayer book. Although Protestant churches were plain in their aesthetic, 
Elizabeth was willing to permit the sacred objects and vibrancy that Catholics preferred. Although the traditional altar was replaced by a communion table, Catholics were permitted to place their own artifacts upon it. Additionally, ornamental crucifixes were restored, along with stained glass windows, candles and cups. These were to be accepted within the Protestant Church and would allow Catholics a sense of familiarity in their place of worship. After all, Protestants were more concerned with the spoken word and the teachings within the prayer book rather than the overall appearance of the church's interior, although many objected to the visual reminders of Catholicism and the Pope. Additionally, the Act of Uniformity would outline the appropriate attire for priests to wear during sermons and introduce Elizabeth's version of the Book of Common Prayer. Presented in English, the Book of Common Prayer was a modification of a highly Protestant prayer book written by Archbishop Thomas Cranmer in 1552, that is during the reign of Edward VI. It contained the services that all churches would have to use, but it was also a cunning tool, because whilst it outlined the services, it left certain areas deliberately vague and open to interpretation, such as the issue of transubstantiation, as Catholics believed the received bread and wine literally became the blood and body of Christ. Protestants, on the other hand, viewed the receiving of the bread and wine as merely symbolic of the blood and body of Christ. Elizabeth evades the issue of transubstantiation by leaving the matter ambiguous within the Book of Common Prayer, and thus prevented her from having to explicitly discredit the Catholic tradition that many wished to uphold. Interestingly, the variations in such beliefs were even considered acceptable to Bishop Stephen Gardner, who was a Catholic bishop. There was, in fact, one particular Catholic belief that Elizabeth herself favoured, she was of the opinion that churchmen ought to devote themselves entirely to God and their profession, so Elizabeth would have ideally refused any clergyman to marry. Ian Mortimer mentions this in his book, The Time Traveller's Guide to Elizabethan England, writing that Elizabeth has to allow the clergy to marry for the avoiding of fornication, but she makes up for this by insisting that they only marry discreet, honest and sober women who have been approved by a bishop. Regardless whether people agreed with these changes and compromises, the Act of Uniformity also made absence from church illegal. You could not boycott the services or refuse to associate with the aspects of another division without receiving a fine. Failure to attend church every Sunday and on holy days would result in a penalty of one shilling or twelve old pence. Such an amount would equate to a few days' wage for a common man, so quite an expensive risk to take. But to Elizabeth's credit, the money collected would be distributed back among the poor. Religion was a dominant issue for the Tudor monarchs, and a risky one for any leaders hoping to introduce change and avoid expenditures. Religion created conflict among common neighbours within the royal court and abroad, where other European countries were at war with each other. Elizabeth's methods would create a church that incorporated enough traditional elements to appease the Catholic division, whilst being Protestant at its core. Elizabeth once stated that she did not mean to make windows into men's souls. For there is only one Jesus Christ, she said, and all the rest is a dispute over trifles. The compromises she made would prevent her from having to persecute a huge majority of the population who were Catholic and exhibit the kind of tyranny her predecessors had. Her tolerance essentially kept a good deal of the population on her side when Catholics later sought to replace her with Mary, Queen of Scots.